today I have five different sections for you. In the beginning there will be two longish pieces uh, that will be the large scale development I, I promised you and then we'll take a break and then there will be three shorter pieces which will be about individual elements in Chicago that I thought I should show you. And the first piece I want to talk about is the Lafayette Park project in Detroit that Mies did in the mid-1950s and he did it along with his, the two people I mentioned earlier, the city planning uh, colleague of his at IIT, Ludwig Hilbersheimer, and the landscape architect at IIT, Alfred Caldwell. And before I start, ta and the idea here that I, of, of the title of pattern and figure is that in architecture we often, and I assume you were already starting to think in terms of figure ground, uh, that you know, positive and negative, that the relationship between positive and negative forms and spaces. Figure ground is a very powerful kind of idea. Buildings as figures are imagined to be important. What Mies, Hilbersheimer, and Caldwell were trying to do at Lafayette Park was create not a figure so much as a pattern. Uh, and the, a pattern uh, is the, the, the concept that, uh, oh, the book rest for your chair, underneath your chair is a pattern, right? It's not a figure. And that's what they were, they were concerned about. Okay. Now, as I keep forgetting to tell you, the motto of the city of Chicago is Urbs in Horto, which from the Latin means city in a garden. And the idea of the city in the garden, and this is a bunch of people settling on the prairie in the 1830s, about 40 years before the concept of the Garden City is advanced and well known throughout Europe. But this idea of the city in the garden is something that was important to people in Chicago early on and continues to inform thinking about the city. So right here, we're looking at what is, is the largest single complex of Mies van der Rohe designed buildings in the world. This is a development of single family houses, townhouses and high-rise apartments in Detroit, Michigan that looks like this. Here's the forest. So this is the product of called Alfred Caldwell's design. Here's the architecture, right? Buried in the forest. And the idea is that if you embed the design in a natural environment, all kinds of benefits accrue. And the, I don't know what the, the, the status of Hilbersheimer is in Brazil or South America, but in, in the United States, Hilbersheimer uh, has been seen to be a, a, an example of the totalitarian qualities of rationalism. So his, his reputation his, uh, at the current moment is relatively low. However, a bunch of scholars in Europe, especially in Milan and in Germany, have started to look at Hilbersheimer again for certain qualities that they think are important. And so a couple of years ago, an exhibition, a publication and an exhibition about Lafayette Park was done by fac faculty and students at the uh, Polytechnic in Milan. And here you see the, in the opening uh, images of it in Milan. Here is another image of the installation in Milan it, and again in Milan. It then traveled to Naples where you can see it installed here. These are the stables of the Palazzo Reale uh, in, uh, in Naples and the contrast of the modernist architecture of Mies with the classical architecture of the stables it was uh, very effective and very strong. Then uh, last, now, uh, I'm, in my head it's still 2013. In 2012, two years ago, uh, the exhibition was brought to Lafayette Park in Detroit and a building that is fairly easy and is where the exhibition was held. It was mounted again. And there was also a symposium about Mies, Hilbersheimer, Caldwell, and Lafayette Park, which engaged people who, lived in, who live in the project, are very excited about it, are also enormously passionate about it and the place of their city. I'm sure you know that Detroit 
as a city is uh, in very dire trouble. I mean, the, the population has gone from two million to less than half a million in 15 years. It's an, an extraordinary circumstance. One of the few neighborhoods of choice in the city is Lafayette Park, and people are thinking, maybe there's something here that we should look at. And then after the exhibition in Detroit, it came to Crown Hall. And here I'm, I'm going to show you a couple of images of the installation at Crown Hall because the, art, the architect, the city planner, the landscape architect who designed this project and, bu and, and built it were all taught within this space. And Crown Hall's age is just about the age of the planning and construction of Lafayette Park. And so here you see these very fine models that students at uh, the Bovisa campus of the Politecnico uh, did. And you get a sense of the kind of slanting light that we have uh, in North America in the, in the afternoon. Now, on this plan, uh, I'm showing you the plan of the center of Detroit. This is from 1807. And the plan is, you might think, well, it's like Versailles. It's like Washington, DC. It's a, 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 a centrally planned kind of urban center from uh, some place in the 17th or 18th century. And in a minute, I'll show you what's going on here. Because there's actually one kind of axis and cross axis here, and another kind of axis and cross axis here. And I'll show you what the reason for the two conflicting systems in a minute. But this street here is the street that then extends out a little about um, most of three quarters of a kilometer from here is this site. So as this site moves out, that's what accounts for the irregular shape of this site that Mies then begins to work with. And this on the right is an early drawing of the project as it develops. The reason for that odd relationship is that Detroit was laid out first by the French. And the French, as you may know, in their colonial planning, like the idea that the Greeks developed of long, narrow lots. People would get long, narrow properties. That means because the river was the highway, everybody needed to get access to the highway. And then on the long, narrow lot, it was understood one would have pasture, one would have water, one would have forest for wood in all of its purposes. One might even have minerals. So all of the kinds of resources that you would want on a piece of land were imagined to be present someplace on these long lots. And the long lots, as the French usually did, were organized, developed perpendicular to the principal line of the waterway. So that's what's going on here. Remember the grid that I showed you, the American grid of, of, that Chicago has uh, to, on Monday? Well, that's the, that's the structure that you see up here. This is, this is the mile square grid. And so what's happening at Lafayette Park is, and again, here is Lafayette Park on the plan. What's happening at Lafayette Park is Mies is picking up on and actually working with resolving the two grids in conflict. Now, and in, here in Sao Paulo, you routinely have the conflict of one set of pattern of streets with another. Sometimes they're gridded. Sometimes they respond to the topography. Sometimes they relate to the river, right? Uh, the river. So this, this is one of the ways in which it's possible to respond to that circumstance uh, and then make some sense of it. So what, also, what this also means is that this is true north. This is the implied north that's in the plan. So this is actually, oh, this would be, uh, on the compass, this would be about 300, 330, someplace in there, uh, or northwest facing. And the, the basic concept of the project was there should be a large central park-like space there should then be subsidiary spaces of these open figures are low-rise buildings. And these blocky forms were understood to be high-rise buildings. There was also to be a school someplace on the site, as well as shopping uh, on the site as well. The reason that 
they kept the underlying geog the geometry of the pre-existing site is before they made a super block, there were a series here of the grid of the city. So in all of these lines is where the water, the sewer, the power systems for the city were already in place. And it would be too expensive to relocate all of that infrastructure. And so that was accepted. And so instead, but instead of being through streets, right? The streets were broken up, the, the utilities went in, went in here, remained here, and then they could tap into all of them for the, uh, for the use of the people in, in their houses. So this is exploiting a, a circumstance of the place. As the plan developed, the constant is the large central open space. I mentioned before that Caldwell liked the idea of the clearing, that you come through the edge of the forest here, and then there are a series of low and low-rise buildings with the ones with the sec second rectangle in the top are the imagined early, early high-rises. And when you get to the site itself, you find something that is really quite lovely. It's really quite lush. Here's one of the very lowest buildings, the one single-story building with one of the high-rises behind it, and this obviously a smart car in the yard. And I think that we're inclined to, we, I talked about the sort of doer figure of Mies last time, and that's often how we are inclined to think about him. He's this very rigid figure. But when you remember that he was actually, well, let me go back this way. When he was actually after something like this, he expected Caldwell to do this. And he also, it's important to understand, was patient enough to wait for the landscape to mature. Now. Where I live, landscapes take 30 to 50 years to mature. And this is a site that's now 60 years old, and it now looks really good. But I was there um, in the 1960s. It was OK, but it, did not, it looked nothing like this. I was there again in the 80s and the 90s. It still looked OK. It's only in about the last 15 years, from about the year 2000. In other words, 40 plus years after the project was completed, that the landscape then achieved its effect, and people now truly see this as a place of choice. So here's Mies, and we talked before about Mies and the relationship to the primitive hut, and here he is looking at the structure of the Farnsworth house. And one of the things I want to suggest to you is the central idea of the Farnsworth house, clear structure, transparent, and reflect wall planes that are simultaneously transparent and reflective, work for the house for a well-to-do physician in Chicago, Dr. Edith Farnsworth, who wanted to have a place where she could get away on the weekend. Mies arranged the house around this, because here's the main line of the house, here's the front steps of the house, and they embrace this very beautiful maple tree that is on the terrace be, uh, above the main channel of the Fox River. Uh, which is flowing by. So this is, the, this is in the background. This is the kind of idea, the strong idea of architecture that is in Mises' mind that now is going to be taken from having been used to solve the house of a very well-to-do person, now to be used to solve the problem of housing for people of the middle classes. And these are images of, Caldwell, of I'm sorry, Hilversheimer in the 1920s, uh, in the 1950s, and here you can see, this is Hilversheimer teaching a number of his students. The student here is Myron Goldsmith. The student here next to him is David Sharp. They, the two of them met working in Skidmore Owings and Merrill's office. Myron had also studied with Mies, and they uh, then taught for many years together at IIT. And we also know, we talked about before, that the status of public housing in America is a very low one, or any kind. And the, that idea is it extends from not just public housing, but all housing that's done in a modernist vein has come in for a great deal of criticism. Uh, and in some case, and this is uh, part of the reason that Kilber Summer's own reputation is relatively low. Here's Caldwell. You saw him before, but as a very old man. He, he's about 94 in the photograph on the left. But here he is as a young man. He apparently had flaming red hair, and he was uh, a very... Um, 
well, every summer or every spring, he would quit teaching at IIT because he wanted to go to his farm. And then every August or September, he would call me up and said, you know, I think I might come back and teach another year. And, and he would. But he w and when Mies was dismissed as the campus architect at IIT, Caldwell was the only member of the faculty who had the courage to give up an income. It's, this, is serious, this is significant courage. He gave up his income. He resigned from the faculty because he would not teach in a university that treated its architect in that way. So this is a person whose moral character has always been uh, important to the, the, the community of IIT, surely. And here's another view of the, extraordinary, of the landscape, the architecture. And you can see that people in Detroit, surprise, have automobiles. The solution here is a dead smart one. They simply berm, they excavated a little bit so they could make a berm around the site. So a person standing on the sidewalk here and a person standing on the sidewalk here looks over the roof of cars and can see their neighborhoods. That simple act of depressing parking, which is really, really cheap. I mean, if you have to dig a garage and do all the form work to get the cars in and out and make the structure of the garage work with the structure of the, of the building. That's expensive and challenging. Here, there's a solution that, is, that yields very beautiful results, and it's fairly easy to get to. Now, this doesn't happen because Mies and Caldwell and uh, Helbersheimer thought, oh, let's go build 100, uh, you know, 120 acres of, that's about uh, 50 hectare of, of housing. Somebody had to be involved. The, key person was the developer Mies worked with for most of his residential work, a man named Herbert Greenwald. Uh, Greenwald like Mies, Mies, Mies like Greenwald, they were a real team. And so from Mies's first tall building in America, the Promontory Point, to the last building they did together, which were these buildings, uh, when Greenwald was killed in an aircraft accident, uh, they, they were a, a really uh, strong and effective team. This is obviously a photograph of the Seagram building behind. And so it's useful then to think that the ideas of the tower, the very abstracted ideas of the tall building that Mies was thinking about in the 1920s, are st and then the idea of low-rise housing. This is the Afrikanische Strasse buildings in uh, Berlin. This is the uh, Mises uh, housing uh, for Weissenhof. Those two were present in Mises' thinking. A building as a symbol, a building, that is to say, a building as a foreground object, and now a building as a background object. Both are, both are in play. And if you have a chance, get a hold of Philip Johnson's uh, catalog of the 1947 Mies exhibition at the Modern, Museum of Modern Art, because at the back of it is Mies's writings, no, known at the time, are translated very well into English by Philip Johnson. If you read German, you may uh, find the originals. But in these two pieces, one both published in Bauen Wohnung, both in 1927, both about apartment houses, Mies says first that they're all about rationalization and standardization. And then he says they're primarily architectural. And then he goes on to say that architecture is a system of values, not a system of rational or practical solutions. So what is happening is Mies is saying both things should be present in a really good building. When I talked about earlier Mies' idea about good and real reasons, here's an example of, wh of where they're, they're coming together. And here's his, the model of the site plan for the Weissenhof project. Here's the uh, plan of the campus at IIT. So Mies has experience with large scale, largely low rise buildings organized into some kind of harmonious re relationship. This one, how many of you have been to Stuttgart to see the Weissenhof? Well, it's a good trip. There are other interesting things in Stuttgart too. But what the model doesn't show very clearly enough is this edge is at the edge of a very steep ravine. It falls off really very sharply. So this group of houses has a great view down across the valley and over the city of Stuttgart. So th this is something that these models and photographs never really convey. But so he misunderstands topography. I understand taking advantage of the view. Here at IIT, he's got this very flat plane of Chicago to work with. And he then places the campus within the grid. 
at Weissenhof, he's able to use topography. In Chicago, the grid is already here, then I'll take, it, I, I'll take advantage of the grid. And he does something that he uses over and over and over again in this part of his American career. The campus is organized symmetrically along the short axis. So there's a little entry zone here, a larger zone here, subsidiary zones here that all tie together as a single defined form. Then there's the kind of figural form of the classroom buildings, the larger form of the representational buildings. He's organized all kinds of ideas into a significant and coherent whole. And so what we're looking at is the development of a very powerful idea that can be expressed in a single story building in the far rural landscape. It can be expressed as here at 860 and 880 Lakeshore Drive, and this is 900 and 910, also in these buildings. The view is from the John Hancock Tower. So, and these buildings, these enormously influential buildings, are only 26 stories. That's shorter than Copan. Like this Copan, I think, is 32. So this, these are, by most standards, these are tall, but not really tall. But in, Mises has figured out how to organize, how to place, how to use these buildings in both circumstances. And here is the promontory, the, the concrete frame, uh, first a high rise uh, Mies does, in does, not just in America. These are three buildings by Mies that create a courtyard of apartment buildings on the campus at IIT. So he's working with this idea, low rise, high rise, how they go together. There is a deep understanding of the frame, as you can see here on uh, in both images that you've seen before. And there's a deep Im Im understanding of the power of, of the frame, the power of the frame, the power to exploit what the frame can do. The transparency here, the reflectivity here, the light coming over the top. I mean, he's built a temple. Right? This is a Greek temple. He understands that. We understand that. He, so he's very concerned about that. Here's the building seen from across the river. And you see the building reflected in the water here and can see it a little better, actually, in reflection. Because in fact, you see it floating above the landscape across the way, but it almost disappears into the landscape. So whether he's doing short or tall, Mies can look out at his production and say, not bad, right? Uh, and that needs to be judged against the hope of modern residential architecture, especially modern residential high rises that we've looked at before, and the reality that occurred. And the key here is that you can frame the argument by how you photograph it. These are two photographs of the same buildings. Right? One building is behind the other. If you photograph it from the landscape, it looks pretty nice. If you photograph it from the parking lot, buildings with parking lots at grade, that doesn't seem to be a very good solution. I don't care if Mies did the building. I don't want to walk across a hot, sunny apart, you know, parking lot to get to the building, no matter how nice. Right? So here, the, these were the last in the sequence. The developers wouldn't build either structured parking or depress the ground plane so they could have depressed parking as elsewhere on the site. And it has a real impact on the, the effect uh, of, that, of the complex. Here you can see how that depression of the lower pieces work, how both when first built, right, this little twig has now become this pretty big tree. I mean, you need, you need to be patient uh, with architecture so that you then get to a point uh, such as this. Here's another way to think about it. This is, a, uh, a, this is the neighborhood that I live in. That little house that I showed you a couple of days ago is there. The schoolyard, the school in my neighborhood is here. And there was a planning principle in Chicago that you take the half mile grid of the city, that's about 800, meter, 800 meters. You take the half mile grid, you have commercial traffic along the perimeter streets, and then all of the interior streets are given over to residential uses, a couple of churches. You put the school in the middle so children can walk to school without having to cross a busy street. 
Now, that was a principle that was already in play and use in Chicago in the, this is from the 18, this neighborhood was developed in the 1880s. Uh, Hilbersheimer also liked the idea that a child could leave its, his or her house and walk to school, especially a young child. And the area here is very close to the area here. This is 120 acres, this is 160 acres, and since this little section of it is cut off, it's about the same as this little section that's cut off here. So we're talking about Mies understanding the density of a typical American neighborhood. I mean, this is not high density, this is nothing like the density that you deal with here in Sao Paulo, but it is the density of Chicago or the density of Detroit, and that's what Mies was addressing. And here I'm going to show you fairly quickly a series of development drawings. Here everything is just lined up on the streets. Here they're beginning to say, how do we start to differentiate? This is one kind of development, this is another kind. They built a model based on this and started to explore it. What's the relationship of the tall buildings to the low buildings? How does the planning work out? Exactly where do we place the school? All of these things are studied and worked out. The school eventually moves from here down to here, right? Uh, the shopping zone changes, so parking is here rather than embedded in here. The L-shaped buildings that uh, were oriented toward the sun, which is something Hilbersheimer always liked to do, were suppressed and the buildings had a more architectural relationship to the existing grid or uh, underlying structure of the site. But parking has now been effectively buried in, in just dozens of different ways to make it the, whole ex the potential experience of the site very powerful. And it meant that by having a very small number of streets entering the site, it meant that a very large number of people had never had to cross or engage parking at all. And those who did have to engage parking had to engage it only in a minimal way. And so here you find you're moving from the final uh, development plan to the site as built. That is to say, Mies got to build this stuff, then the developers left. This has now been redeveloped, has been redeveloped and actually across the street by subsequent architects. The work is, it's high average, I think would be, uh, be fair to say, but it doesn't have, the, it does not have the coherence that the larger scale, that even here, the Mises scale is much larger than any of the other sites. And so it doesn't have the effectiveness. Besides a good developer who Mies had to work with, there's also the mayor of Detroit and the governor of the state of Michigan who were also brought on board. Also involved heavily in this was the president of the auto workers union, Walter Ruther, who was also at, the, at exactly this time working to make sure that the Auto Workers Union remained integrated and was a force for social justice uh, so that the Lafayette Park was begun as, was developed as, and both economically and racially integrated uh, community. And this is another one of its uh, successes, which remains uh, the case today. The other thing I want to point out to you is you're not, well, the form of the building that you're looking at is actually a cake. You can see the plates and the knives here. They're going to cut in, they're going to, they're going to, after the announcements and everything, they're going to cut into the cake and eat the building. And so when we start to recognize the character of the tall buildings in the landscape, the landscape itself, again, these buildings almost seem to go away. The high rises seem only sort of interesting punctuations of, of the view. The automobile exists on the site, but even the centerpieces of the, of, of the roadways uh, work to suppress people driving quickly, dr driving too fast through the site. Here you can see some of the parking, uh, the way parking is actually developed. And I think mostly you start to concentrate on the architecture and the landscape, right? And are not so worried about exactly where the cars go. Although everybody has easy and rapid access to their car. And so as you get closer to the buildings, the, the mature landscape uh, is very powerful. The buildings themselves become mirrors of, of, as you move through the space. 
the buildings almost merges. I mean, are we looking at leaves on trees through the building, or are we looking at the reflection of leaves in front of the building? Or the same thing is happening here as you look at what's reflected in the glass. The architecture, Mies liked to say that what he wanted to do should be almost nothing. Right? He wanted to pin, you know, pare down architecture so much that it became almost nothing because the real purpose was the lives people could live in these, in these shared open spaces. Or uh, as you can see here or here, we're looking at a vignette of Lafayette Park and here you're looking at a corner of Crown Hall on the IIT campus where that same quality of the glass itself is reflecting the ceiling of the building of moving away from it. You see through the building the landscape outside. You see shadows of the landscape. You see shadows of the column, the mullions on the windows. Right? The building is this constant com communicator of what it is that's inside. Okay. Next I want to talk about this idea of material transformation which is to say Chicago is a city of steel. Your city is reinforced concrete. So the way you use your, your materials certainly may be different than the way use our, we use ours. But Chicago is a city of steel, or thinks it is. They made a lot of steel there. Uh, and so I want to talk about that. Again, here's Chicago. By some counts, the first Bessemer steel making, steel making furnace in the world was here in Joliet, Illinois. Now, we usually think that the first um, Bessemer converter's furnace for taking iron and, convert and heating it at a high enough degree that it became steel that you could produce in industrial quantities, right? Up until the, until the middle of the 19th century, steel was a very difficult material to fabricate. Cast or wrought iron was really easy, but steel was much more difficult to make in any kind of large quantities. When this device was developed, it took, it took off, it changed the world. And one of the earliest uh, such factories was, uh, pr production sites, was in Illinois. So here's Chicago, here's Joliet, here's present day Gary where there's still active steel be being made. And the site that I, and, here, and the site I'm gonna be talking about is here, it was, the large, it was the large site occupied by both the United States Steel Company and the Wisconsin Steel Company on a site of about one mile. Well, those companies went out of business 20 years ago. The site is on the lakefront because that's access to materials over the water. The site is on the lakefront and there's been discussion about what should be done to repurpose this very large site with, you know, right on the lake itself. The, natural answer seems to be residential use. And to understand, the, the, I'm going to show you some images of steel making or the, the artifacts of steel making in Chicago. This is one of the uh, harbors of the Great Cranes. Uh, here's that image of the pollution of the lake that, that's also in play. Here's the city that we make out of all of the steel, right? The steel is made in the neighborhood. Uh, the, we've, we've done some bad things with it, but it's certainly part of our experience, part of what we do. And We've used it, right, as an industrial product, as an architectural product, as with the bean or with the uh, band shell, uh, right? We've used it as an ornamental product, right? So here the, the steel has become a symbol of something having to do with the industrial past, but the industry is not here anymore. The industry is in Korea, in China, in of uh, uh, Swansea and, Ye and Wales, I expect, I don't, I expect there's a large steel making industry in Brazil. I don't know where it is, but it would be, you, you've got to make your rebar someplace and I doubt you buy it all from China. Uh, so that, isn't there a significant steel making capability in Brazil? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, this was, I mean, making steel was for well over a hundred years, the symbol of being a modern industrial culture in the way today, I guess you want to make circuit boards or something, but making steel was understood to be, be key for that. And now it's changed, and it's that change I want to trace. Here you're looking at some of the bricks and limestone, 
that were part of the, the steel making process in Joliet. Here's the base of one of those uh, converters. That is to say, now this is a park that very few people go to see, and they can see here is some residue of our industrial past, but that industry is all over. All of those jobs have gone away uh, to, to someplace else. And even here, this, this is something that's uh, 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 well over 100 years old now, it had fairly large scale. This is the kind of, of debris that then rested, at, that fell out of the bottom of the great converter uh, cauldrons in which the steel was made. So that's an awful lot of people's lives and energy that go into it. Uh, steel making, the buildings themselves are impressive, very large and impressive objects. And as we talked about before, you've, uh, we've come back to the, the great growth. In, it, it's in just about 1870 that Chicago starts to, or the Chicago region starts to make steel. And it's in just about 1870 to about 1950 that Chicago makes a lot of steel. And it's from about 1950 to the present that Chicago has been making less steel, uh, significantly less, so that the history of the city is in, in not just some ways, not symbolic ways, but in many ways is tied to that kind of concept. So whether it's Mises high rises made out of steel or the elevated train system, which is uh, now 125 years old, both of these are products of steel. The campus at IIT is built out of buildings made on steel frames. The steel itself is celebrated on the exterior of the buildings. This is the way that we put all of this stuff together. And if you organize the steel in a clear and rational enough way, you can get something as beautiful as Crown Hall, uh, or seen here through a landscape designed by Caldwell. Or in the interior, the exterior is always available to, to you because steel's strength to weight ratio is very high. Uh, that's one of the reasons that we like it. It means you can have very large sheets of glass. And as you take a look at, this is the kind of stuff our students do. Uh, Mies liked the model, and we like that. We continue to like that idea. And so our, our students uh, build lots and lots and lots of models, as you can see, at many different scales. And what's happening here is this is the time. This is just at the end of the spring semester. And the models that are being thrown away are getting shoved off to the side. And the models that we will, will be displayed in the spring exhibition are being selected and, and called out. Uh, but this kind of silhouette uh, that you get throughout the building is one of the, the real pleasures of, of, of teaching here for, for so many years. And the debris of students in the building uh, begins to become apparent as things get moved around. But let's go back to this idea and the, the omnipresence of steel. Oh, there's one last thing I want to get here. The module of this building, we were talking about it last night. The module of the building is units of 10. This is 5 feet wide. This is 5 feet wide. This is 10 feet. Uh, and because we're not, we don't, we're too dumb to learn to count with metric, I guess, uh, or to measure with it. We still work in feet and inches. And Mies used the module of 10 in this building. And what that means is the students, whenever they want to know about scale, whenever you're making a drawing, you're using your scale, right? And you say, well, OK, well, I know roughly what that. I can tell you exactly what this is. But then you try and visualize it. And sometimes you can't do it very easily. Well, in Crown Hall, all a student has to do is look up and say, oh, that's 10 feet in reality as opposed to the representation of 10 feet in a scale, in a scale drawing on your laptop uh, or on your, on, on your paper. So here we come back to this idea of the frame having been anointed and particularized in the 1700s, right? the clarity of the frame. The, uh, the, the Jesuit priest, I think Jesuit priests founded Sao Paulo. Uh, anyway, the Jesuit priest who wrote the book for which this is the front uh, illustration said that walls are sort of stupid things. You know, they're just enclosures. They just have to do with people's comfort. 
And since architecture is about structure, and if you buy into the idea that architecture is about structure alone, if architecture is about structure, we find its origins in nature, and we then uh, build from that. So, and it's, I think, fair to say that Mies is a person who found that idea of the clarity of structure a very uh, attractive one. So that uh, here, when Lakeshore Drive is completed, it becomes a fairly powerful and effective device. And as we've talked about before, the developed area of the region has grown very much. But there's a constant discussion. Um, as you know, I expect it's a routine thing in the school here that density is a virtue. Isn't this one of the things that you, right? And it, I think all architects all over the world sort of agree with that concept. Most other people don't like density. They don't, or at least most Americans, they don't want to be, they would like to be as far away from their neighbors as they can be. Uh, so the, the effect of sprawl is very great. So the project that's being developed for just about here on the lakefront is an effort to de-densify this region and re-densify this region. I don't know if it'll work or not, because that's pretty nice. I mean, if I had the money to have a house like this way out in the country with nobody around, there's something very attractive to that. Right? I, don't think you, I, I don't think you can get away from it. And so when someone, instead of this, has a house in the suburbs and the lot's not very big and the design isn't very great, still it's theirs and it's separated from others. So this is an idea, a concept that I think has to be at least acknowledged as, as, as you begin to think uh, about what you want to do. So if this is the source of Mises thinking, it now can be applied to the dwelling. This is Dr. Farnsworth and her dog were, uh, planting flowers as the building is under construction. So that now you've got this very lovely, this very lush device. This is the, ide this is the ideal that many people think, this is what a house should be like a beautiful little building set in a park-like setting. And so when you try and densify something, you may encounter something different. And here are some additional images of, of the Farnsworth house. Now, one of the sort of subtexts of what I'm doing uh, in all of this is I'm trying to set it up so one of the itinerarios, one of the traveling studios um, here at um, the Escola uh, says, who wants to go to Chicago? And when you come to Chicago, we'll welcome you with open arms. We'll show you Crown Hall. We'll show you whatever it is that you want to see. But this is also uh, part of what we're trying, uh, what I'm trying to do. And talk to uh, I don't know where, where that went. Uh, so again, looking into the house, you can see the transparency and reflectivity of it. All of these extraordinary qualities. One of the things that we do can you see right here that the white of the steel is, be, is reflecting the sunlight so brightly that there's a little sort of hot spot of light over here? And one of the things that uh, is routinely done at IIT is students will be brought out here, asked to look at the sun falling over the wide flange and creating a whole series of shadows. And they're supposed to then start to count the shadows and reflections that are in that simple little piece. It's like if someone in a draw, a paint, one of your painting or drawing teachers asks you to look at something and say, how many colors are in what we're looking at? And then if you really start to look, you discover that the leaf is not a uniformly single green, it's actually many greens, that the flower is not a uniformly single color, it's actually many colors, that the sky is not a uniform blue, but many colors. And the more you build up that kind of perceptiveness about the world ar around you, the assumption is, the more sensitive you are, the more effective you can be. Uh, and so here we, uh, again, see the way all of this can be resolved. And the challenge, of course, is to get these kinds of qualities into a project of very large scale. This is paradise, right? Uh, and also to remember that this beauty comes from a factory like this. Right? This is where the material is made. The material is made here, and then it's transformed into something else. So back to the bean in Chicago and all of its character, 
buildings uh, rising out of the ground, the bean as this great symbol this, of the history of the city, the images that we've seen already reflecting the city at night. Or even, this is my favorite part of the bean. When you step inside it, here's a reflection of the ground plane reflected on the underside of the bean. You discover that you're not present just here. You're present here. You're present here. You're present here. And one of the great things is to watch a child start to see, I'm not just there once. I'm two, three, four, five, six, seven. I mean, it's something that is exciting to uh, almost everyone who comes into the space and shares the space. And we've also talked about the way the fountain operates with children uh, playing in it uh, with uh, great excitement. And this kind of, right, this is what you want your architectural design project to yield. No matter how hard you had to work to make it, to make it work, and making it work so the little seam that takes, you can see this is a very shallow pool of water. I could walk on the water with my shoes and not get the uppers wet, right? I mean, the water is so thin. But still, it's water. It's a mirror. And the, the system of draining and recirculating the water on the edge is something exciting. So there are a whole series of technical problems that have to be solved. At the same time, that is something that is exciting and enlivens the city. In fact, you could say that what Plensa has done is the flat sheet of water mirrors the lake. The towers mirror the tall buildings of the city, and the people's photographs of the, of the towers indicate the humanity of the place. So the flatness of the lake and the land, the, the greatness of the towers, and the presence of people even being able to be funny about themselves and have a sense of humor about themselves and one another, all of this then feeds into what's happening here. And the, listening to the children scream when the waterfall comes on after the, after the person has spit water out, then this big waterfall comes down the front. And so there's this whole cycle of enjoyment of, of the fountain. Or the fields of lavender in front of the, uh, the piano addition to the art museum we've, we've, we've looked at before. Piano is now saying, well, gee, this is a city of steel. Let's see how we can use these material elements to, uh, to make something great. Let's play the steel and other materials of this art museum against the railroad traffic, because both are part of the life of Chicago. Let's not deny one uh, to achieve the other. And let's, on the interior, you know, create this powerful relationship between the ground plane, the inside and outside, uh, and all of those elements that we've been talking about. Or, of the Magritte up against the wall and looking across the landscape, or now back to the manufacture of steel. So that's one way of thinking about steel. This is the site now that oh, all of that's introduction, the discussion of this site. And so again, the site has a, has a view of, of the city. It is close to the loop. It is, the idea is to be developed as a fairly dense place with parks all along the lakefront, because parks along the lakefront are what characterize the Chicago from one end to the other. And this is the mouth of the, of the Calumet River, the river at the south end of the city of Chicago. So this is where all of this densification is supposed to occur. And you can see, too, that just as at Lafayette Park, the architects are thinking of some fairly dense high-rise clusters, right? The rents get pretty big, so let people see the water. And then some slightly less dense, low-rise clusters with a great deal of more or less private open space and then more or less public open space. The, act the access to park space, has a, there are many issues uh, that are in play. And, and SOM is trying to deal with all of them. And then, of course, there's a marina for the boats that everybody here is expected to own. Here's the site itself. Here's the underlying grid of Chicago. Here's the harbor of Lake Calumet. So this, this is the present day. Here's the river coming in here and then having access to the harbor. And in a little bit, I'll show you another site that's just south of this form. So remember this egg-like form that we'll be looking at something south of it. 
Uh, so here's the, they're trying to do a scale comparison. So here's our site, and here's the condition of the site today. Uh, and our site is about the size of the loop, that cluster of very tall buildings. That's how big we're talking about. Something in the neighborhood of 160, well, uh, you know, closer to 300 acres. Uh, again, uh, something on the order of 150 hectare. Do you think in hectares? Rather, when, when you talk about land areas, do you think in terms of hectare but not acres, right? Uh, and if, if you don't know, a hectare is two and a half times an acre, an acre. This big site with this big slip, which is part of the access of the, rip, the boats that bring the iron ore and the coal in and take the steel out. Uh, along here, you can see these two great walls. These were the bunkers where the raw materials would be stored. Uh, in, they'd just be offloaded from the ships in the slip. And so the idea is to, and here you see them in this, in this view, the idea is then these elements would be retained as part of the embedding the history of the place there as, as the rest of it is redeveloped. Here's, here's one, a side view of the photograph of one of these great yalls. And obviously, the site has, this, has a view both back to the loop, but also uh, out over the lake itself. Here's a view of the site from between 1880 and 1980, the beginning and ending periods of its development. I expect you've been to factory sites around here or looked at them from tall buildings. They're just as uh, messy, and, uh, but for the person who is working here, it's absolutely logic and, uh, logical and, se and uh, sensible. They, though, just as at that little furnace I showed you a few minutes ago, left some slag around. There's a lot, there's 40 feet of debris on the site that uh, is largely inert, but it's still something that has to be dealt with. Below that is sand, below that is clay, below that is uh, limestone, uh, bedrock. So there's the issue of clearing the site. Right? That's just a big job. All of this stuff, just packing it up, right? Taking it to the iron recycler or selling, sending it to wherever. Uh, that's a big job, but the site has now been cleared, a major act. They have just completed a roadway that follows this line through the site that is an extension of the Lakefront Expressway, Lakeshore Drive. Uh, some of it's not complete, but they've developed this extension here. So the city is starting to put in the infrastructure because the infrastructure that was here wasn't concerned about residential or ordinary human use. All of that needs to be done. Water, sewer, electrical, phone, gas, all of the utilities that are, are necessary. And there's, on the part of, of the team, a real desire to not only make the neighborhood cohere within itself, but connect to the rest of the community around it. And one of the virtues is there is a commuter rail line that is high speed uh, relatively high speed uh, that is runs through along the western edge of the site. So it's one, two, three, four stations are accessible uh, near the site. And as they begin to think about what they're going to do, uh, they say, well, you know, park front, interior parks, uh, other developments along the site, this is how we begin to think about um, what it is that's in place. They're also concerned about energy efficiency and the environment. So there, here are a whole series of the factors that they need to think about and the way they're going to achieve them. There's a recognition that they can do a more sophisticated, more up-to-date cooling system by using the already quite cool water of Lake Michigan. The uh, Lake Michigan below about Lake Michigan is nearly 700 feet deep. That's uh, more than 300 meters. Uh, so the bottom of Lake Michigan is below sea level. So it's a very large lake. And the lower three quarters of the lake, the water is very, very cold. So the plan is to take that very cold water, use it as a chiller, uh, and then introduce that for the cooling of, of the building. Toronto has already begun to do this. 
and there's a proposal to do a similar thing here. I'm not sure that you have great uh, reservoirs of cold water in, <laughs> in Sao Paulo. Uh, there's also a, a, de a decision to make, uh, take advantage of the, break, of, of the breakwater, which will have a, a, a beneficial effect on the site. There's a desire that all of the water that falls on the site, or 91% of the water that falls on the site, can be filtered and returned to the lake rather than put into the sewer and taken to St. Louis, right? So there's a, a real concern here about how they deal with the volumes of water. And you know, 44 million anything is a pretty large number, uh, at least in, in my head, right? So being able to do that uh, becomes uh, useful. There's this desire as well to connect to the lakefront park. One of the things that makes Chicago particular, and I'll talk about more of it in a, in a few minutes, is the, uh, the habitat for uh, critters, especially for birds. Um, in North America, birds fly north in the spring and they fly south in the fall. And on both, le both the northbound and southbound trip, Lake Michigan is very attractive as an edge to fly along. The air over the lake is relatively stable, so it makes it the birds use less energy to fly through that air. They then have the lakefront adjacent to them where they will find places of shelter and rest overnight as well as food. So all of those things are in play. And it's a part of Chicago's environmental policy that even transients in the city are welcome and we want to make the, encourage them uh, to be here. These ore walls, which are what these big bunkers are all about, are, can be seen here and also this kind of extraordinary flatness of the site against the flatness of the lake. I should tell you when Louis Sullivan, who we've talked about before, first came to, and this idea of the, of the flatness of the lake and the flatness of the land I think is important. When Louis Sullivan first came to Chicago, he told a very good story. Not all of it is exactly true. He said that this, the smoke from the, the Chicago fire was still sort of in the air. Well, not really. He arrived two years after the fire. There wasn't too much. Tinder. But he said that in one direction extended the lake to the far horizon as the Great Flat Plain. And the other direction extended the land, the prairie, to the horizon. And then over his head was the great dome of heaven, right? And he said he jumped up and down and said, this is the place for me. Because he was in, for him, an area that was so open and undeveloped, this is where a person would want to make their architectural career. A few years later, Frank Lloyd Wright came to Chicago, got off the train, and saw for the first time, and was actually a little bit disturbed by the, ele the electric lights that were used on the train platform. Now we begin to get the kind of renderings of how the park can be developed, and as I'm sure you know, this is not necessarily exactly how it's going to look. But the idea of a place in which the rawness of the industrial past can be played against the carefully formed character of the landscape and played against further the uh, residential uh, buildings that will then line this site, all of this then begins to be part of, of, of the discussion and part of the scene. And as they continue to, as, as you've looked at this plan over and over, you can see that it's been refined. Just as Mies and his team kept refining the plan at Lafayette Park, the team here uh, at Lakeside, as they, they call it, is also uh, developing. And some proposals for what to do with the, uh, the, work, the forms read like this. Uh, other, and if they're looking at these buildings, that may be where those, those forms come from. Okay. I want to now move to a redevelopment of a piece of abandoned industrial land, but at a rather smaller scale. The site area is pretty big. This is a site of, I think, 120 acres, so about 50 hectare. So it's a good sized site, about the site of Lafayette Park. It was used, it's a kind of interstitial space that was used mostly for dumping by various industries uh, in the 
not too far from the steel mill sites that we just looked at, is part of Chicago's industrial development. The Ford Motor Company has a large assembly plant near here. They are the most recent owners of the site, and they gave the site to the city of Chicago to develop as a park. So this is the background of the project. And then this project comes, comes into Jeannie Gang's office, and this is a, a project of hers. It has, because this is a public project, um, it has still not been begun. But I asked Jeannie about this just before I came down. I said, is this really you know, in the waste, in the uh, over? Or, and she said, no, it actually people are starting to talk about it. Again, people are starting to insert money for it into uh, municipal budgets. But this is very much an example where you have to be prepared for a very, very slow process. Uh, And so the site is, because Ford gave it, it's going to be the Ford Calumet, uh, Calumet name for the, uh, the river, uh, the, the environmental se uh, center. And one of the things that Jeannie has been concerned about, this isn't, these aren't natural materials. These are pieces of steel, right? But if you gather it all together, it reads, right? If you call it a nest, then you're inclined to read it as a nest. But so she's starting to think about, well, what would be the best kind of nest, the kind of resting place for people who are tired, because this is also part of that flyway, that the migratory passage that is at Calumet. It's flat. And the idea then is to create some kind of structure, some kind of canopy that allows people to have recourse from the city around them and then start to engage the landscape. One of the things that is, and I don't know if this is, is, is the case in Brazil, but in the United States, the industrial development of the country poisoned, frequently poisoned the land that it was directly on, but the land that was adjacent to it was untouched. So along the sides of the railroad right-of-ways is untouched land. In many cases, this land has been untouched which means that the native plant species are still there. The native plant species of the Middle West, the prairie plants, have a very, very, very deep root system. And their habit over about millions of years has been every year they sort of push up against the, against the surface. And if the weather is nice, they'll continue to grow. If it stays OK, they'll continue to grow. If the weather is crappy, they'll just shut off. And then they'll just stay in the ground. And they'll try it year after year after year. And what people are discovering in these prairies is that the native plants are still there. And if they're allowed to come up and have decent environments in which to grow, they will blossom. They will fertilize themselves. They will spread. They will make a very attractive environment. So there needs to be, as people learn more about the actual character of the natural world, they can then exploit this. And this is part of, and learning about this is, I mean, it's partly a lifelong interest of, of Jeannie and, and Mark, her partner, but it's also something that she recognized is a morally and professionally responsible thing to do, uh, to think about the, the landscape in that way. So here's that Lake Calumet that I talked about just a minute ago. Uh, here is the site of the lakeside that we were just looking at a minute ago. And here is the site uh, that Jeannie is starting to work on. So this large object here is this large object here. And so this quadrilateral uh, project that you see here is the site that she's working with. It's along the river. Some of it is wetland. Some of it, so this is all fairly marshy land. Um, but there, that means then it's got a very interesting existing biota. Here and here, these topographic lines go down. They don't go up. They're, you're not looking at hills. You're looking at quarries. So these are limestone quarries because one of the key ingredients for the making of steel is lime. And if you've got lime, as in limestone, nearby, you dig it out and you then carry it a very short distance over to the steel mill and you then can begin to uh, put it to work for you. You can transform it. And one of the things, so research takes many forms. One of the forms is simply 
making an inventory of all of the crap that's been dump dumped on the site. So uh, just as in that first image, well, let's just collect a pile of this stuff and see what it is. Uh, then piles of stuff are collected. Copper is valuable. Other stuff is, is less so. They begin to organize it into bins of one sort or another. They then begin to look at the kinds of things they find on the site and say, how can I take advantage of this? Can I use it in some way? I mean, you, can, you recognize this as the kind of steel reinforcing that's used for uh, building columns. And then people throw them away if they don't need them anymore. Well, maybe there's a way in which we can think about recycling this material. So then this whole series of ideas about what can be done uh, start to emerge. There is also the generation of imagery, right? This is a list about research. This is an image that's about how do I take what I know and make it a gift? How do I make it beautiful? How do I make it lovely? And that means that the research has to continue. It has to be hard-headed. You have to learn all the different kinds of trees and birds and plants and all the rest of it. You then have to think about what the site is, where access to the site is, how you could move through the site. One of the decisions was they wanted to keep the automobile out of the site as much as possible. So the environmental center is placed here at a corner so that people driving in get out of their cars very quickly. In other words, they don't drive all around here and then park, right? Uh, they get out of their car very quickly and then walk through the site. And an advantage in Chicago of its being fairly, very flat, it means that all of the trails can be made accessible to the disabled. So this is also, this is again, another aspect of, of bringing people and making it possible for people to engage the world around them. And here's a census of the critters that are already present and a census of the critters who would likely be present if they're successful in the plan. So a site that has debris and stuff on it uh, now has the opportunity to become something better. And this idea of the nest uh, is something that Jeannie has been interested in uh, almost all of her life. And so she's interested in it. She makes drawings of it. She explores them. She collects them uh, in her office in Chicago. She has a shelf with dozens of, of bird's nests on them. And then begins to think about, well, what are these things? What are the elements that are involved? So it shouldn't be too surprising that the kind of relaxed curve that she draws in a, a, in a feather is also the kind of relaxed curve that you see uh, going on in the form of the building itself. And she also is smart enough to look at uh, Alfred Caldwell's drawings. So you've got this kind of pointillist or dot-like uh, image of what? Are we looking at a landscape plan? Are we looking at a building plan? Are we looking at someone simply making a design and sort of just looking at what happens when you make a dot and then you make another dot and then you make a, select another color and you make another one and you start to let the, de the design, the drawing, speak back to you? And there's that wonderful, I mean, I'm sure all of you get great pleasure from that experience of this conversation with, of, of a drawing and, and watching it happen. And sometimes you don't, you know that your hand was there, but you don't really remember it because it seems to have emerged by itself. And so that kind, so in fact, and, the, and, the, and most of these images, as I'm sure you figured out, are from a publication of Jeannie's own work. So we're looking at the artist presenting, or the architect pre, uh, presenting herself. So if this form is not too different or not too abstracted from this form, then you can begin to say, oh, these are one of the ways in which one kind of an idea can be translated or merged into another kind of idea, certain kinds of qualities of what, topographic forms, intersecting forms, whatever, that we've seen in prior drawings start to emerge as possibilities in the building, right? Excuse me. And that drawing can then become more carefully developed. Uh, the elements can be presented in this way. Last night at dinner, we were talking about uh, the building. Uh, you were, Maria, you were telling me about buildings that use this kind of uh, structural form uh, uh, in, in them. And so this is a result of wide reading. Jeannie's also looking at 
what happens when birds hit glass. Right? She just started to collect the dead birds when they flew into the glass wall of a building. It says, if you aggregate them, if you, she collects all kinds, if you aggregate them, you then say, can I do something with my use of glass that doesn't result in this kind of destruction? Right? You see, a, you walk up to a building and you see a bird on the ground and it, you figure, oh, it must have you know, hit the glass wa the window above you. Well, it's one bird, that's too bad. Right? There are many more. But if you then start to aggregate them, uh, and they're right, very little ones and fairly big ones, you begin to say, Maybe there's something else that I should be thinking about. Maybe there's something else I should be doing. There's a concern to place the building on a, the ground in such a way that it doesn't make great demands either on the ground below it. By planting the roof uh, with natural materials, you make sure that it's, uh, it's both green and make, doesn't make demands on the heating, the whatever system you're going to use to uh, modify the air inside. Then begin to imagine how, what happens with this cage-like structure, this nest-like form, that then provides visual access to the city beyond, but also the landscape and the uh, environment uh, around it. Bringing us back to the uh, steel, right? This is where Chicago begins, or this is one of the places Chicago begins. Making steel, taking natural elements, right? Coal is found in the ground, iron ore is found in the ground, limestone is found in the ground, Water is found in the lake. Right? All of these are natural elements. You apply heat to them, and you then create uh, all kinds of things from it. The individual elements are natural. They're more or less freely available. And then we've created the world that we occupy today. And think about, oh, this is a sad old factory. Actually, it's not an old factory. It's still making steel. Let me then switch to another way that steel can be put to quite powerful use. This is the John Deere, fact, or John Deere office complex in East Moline, Illinois. This is about 100 miles straight west from Chicago. The architects are Eero Saarinen's office in first Michigan, and that, uh, now the office is relocated to Connecticut. The John Deere company makes tractors. I expect an awful lot of agricultural implements in Brazil are John Deere uh, uh, tractors and other, uh, other implements. It's uh, a company founded about 150, 170 years old, ago, and it's still a, a thriving and very successful company. And they said, well, let's build ourselves a new office headquarters uh, just outside of town, make it a pleasant environment for the office workers. Uh, Saarinen does the building. Sasaki does the landscape. The building is a demonstration of the kinds of materials that go into making tractors and combines and all of their products, right? The particular steel that they use is core 10 steel. Uh, that's a, a kind of steel that self-weathers. Uh, it creates a very thin uh, layer of rust that doesn't continue to rust. And so it needs very, most steel, if, it's, if, it, if exposed, needs a great deal of maintenance. This is a way to, have, to use steel that it doesn't need ma uh, such maintenance. The steel was put together in very precise and careful ways. Uh, I've got, here's a, a, a detail. This, the welding, the actual construction of the building was done by men who worked as welders in the tractor factory. And because they were building the office building for their own company, they made sure that every single weld was as perfect as possible. Right? So the, it's often said that modern architecture, that modern architecture, modern times, have alienated the worker from the work, right? That work is only rewarding if it's done by hand. Well, this is work that's done by hand, by a person who is using modern techniques, modern materials. They're engaged in it. There is, for these workers, real pride in what they do. And so the perception that all work that's done is unattractive work, except my own, because I love what I do, uh, or your own, because you love what you do, that may be a mistake, that someone who works doing this every day, that's, you know, with a big hood and a welder, it's not something I think I would like to do, but some people do find themselves, find that rewarding work. And you can see that here on this, on this building. And it becomes part of the place. And we've talked about reflectivity 
And I especially like the way this polished concrete floor on the interior is mirrored by this unpolished, high, uh, very aggregated concrete or steps on the exterior. So you're not looking, you're, this is mirror image, but they're two, actually two different things. When you visit Deer, you come into a large welcoming pavilion where they show their products, which is one thing that they do. And Deer also, all of these gentlemen are tractor customers from uh, on the day that these photographs were made, they were visiting from the American state of Alabama. And in addition to all, the, all of the equipment, from a very early John Deere plow or disc, you know, a plow, uh, to very modern ones, there is a very large display of the life of the American farm uh, designed and installed by the American designer Alexander Girard. And uh, if you don't know him, if you don't know about him, uh, he's worth looking up. I mean, he's a really very interesting character from about oh, 1940 to 1980 as the uh, key part of his career. And what he do, what Gerard shows in assembling all of this is, oh, I'm sorry, is the whole range. I, I thought I had a, a detail of this. The whole range of farm life. So there's not only ads for deer tractors and stuff, but there are thimbles and needles and thread because the mother or the usually the woman in the house was doing that kind of work whereas the men in the house were usually out working in the field but all of the work that was done in this community of the family on the farm what is is represented uh, here in this long display of uh, at John Deere and that brings us back to again this place where we make uh, steel and what that means and how that affects our lives. Okay. Now, I want to talk about three things. The first two are buildings that are relatively small, and, that, and because mostly we've been looking at large buildings and large projects, I thought it would be a good idea to finish up by looking at build, some buildings that were relatively small. And then also, as I was thinking about what I've been showing you, uh, I've most, mostly been showing you Chicago seen from the lake or along the lake. And I've said a couple of times that behind all the tall buildings is a very different place. Well, I put together some images that I had to make that more clear so you can understand that a little better. And I've done that in a way that will also allow me to show you the kind of current projects that exist at a relatively small scale uh, in the city that are mostly addressed at achieving architecture of very high quality for communities that ha usually have little choice about the kinds of buildings that they, they use and have available uh, to them. But I wanted to begin by showing you briefly the Charnley House. Uh, one of the reasons that I want to show you the Charnley House and I'm reminded too, there was an architect, an English architect who was born in Sweden, who studied in France, and is most famous for writing a book of architecture in China. And he said, his name is, who said that travel is for the architect what a library is for the scholar. That is to say, you can only truly know a building by being in it and seeing it like this. An image is useful, it reinforces things, but you must uh, see it. This is the, archi the English architect William Chambers who made this point. And I want to show you, first of all, Charnley House in Chicago. This is a house designed by Louis Sullivan one of the draftsmen in Sullivan's office at the time was Frank Lloyd Wright. Wright made the claim that you saw just a second ago, the first modern house in America, and then he said that he had a lot to do with the design. It seems fairer to say that this is mostly Sullivan's design in which Wright participated as a member of the office. The house is a relatively small house. This corner site, at the end of this block, which is fairly short, is the lakefront. 
so it's close to the water. But the, the people who built this house used to have a house directly facing Lake Michigan. And the understanding is they didn't like the winter storms coming off the lake, so they moved around the corner to an interior. This wall of the house, this is one of the few streets in Chicago that comes to an intersection and then moves to the side and then moves further north. So that means that this facade terminates the vista down the street that faces in this direction. It does it very well. The house, as you can see, is rests on a base of Indiana limestone. And the limestone then rises up to frame the entry door. Above that is a mass of Roman bricks, a kind of gold, tawny golden color. Very, the windows are carefully incised. And projecting over the front door is a wooden porch uh, that you'll, you'll see more of later. The house is a fairly small house. You enter through the door in the center. There is a dining room on the first floor on this side. And on this side is, from front to back, is a living room uh, space. Beyond the front door is a staircase that leads up. And on the north end of the building is one bedroom. On the south end of the building is another bedroom. On the third floor are more rooms for one of the children and staff. In the basement, the kitchen was here. The wine cellar was under here. And the furnace and storage was, uh, was here and here. So it's a fairly small house, right? Seen in direct elevation, it is a very simple assemblage. And you can begin to see the way in which the house is a kind of assemblage of volumes, volumes in both the elevation and then receding back into the building. You can almost imagine how the pieces were carved out and then assembled. As you enter the front door, and the front door is at street level, but you can see that the windows are fairly high up. So just inside the front door are, is a shallow, a short flight of stairs that brings you up into facing a fireplace. So as soon as you come through the front door and the second door, the fire is a symbol of welcome in almost all cultures. The fireplace itself is surrounded by uh, ornamental designs of Sullivan's, uh, which you can see here. And it, it, it extends down onto the hearth. To the left of the fireplace is the beginning of the staircase going upstairs. So you come in, see the fireplace, and then behind the fireplace is the staircase. And if you think about it, where, right, where, if there's a staircase going up here, then what, how do they handle the problem of uh, venting the fireplace? And as you move uh, now to the left here through the arch on the left in the image, you come into the, li uh, the living room. The bust over the fireplace is of the man who gave the building to the Society of Architectural Historians. So you be nice to people like that. And here you can see one of the two ways that uh, Sullivan liked to work with ornament. One of them was where the ornament comes forward of the plane of the wood behind it. And in a minute, I'll show you examples where Sullivan explores what happens when you carve behind the frame, so the, uh, the plane. So both of those uh, qualities are in place. As you come back into the front hall, you can see where the staircase is going up and then starting here. And as you look up yourself, you see one, uh, two stories above you, this slot of space. The stair is over here. Uh, this slot of space with a skylight at the top, dropping light down into the interior with incised ornamental patterns here in the, uh, in the, in the plane of the, of the building. And as you move up the stair, you begin to recognize that you're in some special kind uh, of environment. All of this wood, all of these thin pieces of wood, their, their shape is rather like the shape of weed holders that Frank Lloyd Wright designed and used later in his own career. There are, ele there are clearly elements um, that are part of Wright's work. But shortly after this building was, was designed and built, 
Wright did a building with a similar organization, and he made a whole series of mistakes, which is to say he didn't understand completely what Sullivan was about uh, in this building. And as you look at that elevation straight on, you can see that it is slightly wider at the bottom than at the top. It is beaded up for about a big third, but not quite half of its length. And, the, and through the screen of these very narrow balusters, you can see the indications of the treads of the stairs as the, as the stair moves up uh, above you. So the building is both hiding and revealing its character. It's making you understand um, the parts, uh, all of its parts and, and how they work together. And one of the most beautiful things that occurs in the building is imagine you're here and just under this railing is another band of ornament as you see here and if you're there at the right time of day and the sun is coming through that band then the light that passes through these openings on this side of the space is then broadcast on the wall in the distance and the and clearly this is the kind of exploitation of the passage of the sun and bringing light into the interior of the building. So we come back outside and then here we are. The building is simple, it's straightforward, it is elegantly uh, decorated and ornamented. It is a very, very, very simple building in, in so many ways. It is, I'll tell you in advance, uh, like the Glessner House, this is 10 years after the Glessner House, but like the Glessner House in being entered essentially in the center of the mass of the building, going through a door at the street and then up a flight of stairs. And what makes this uh, distinctive is the typical way of entering a house in Chicago is to go up a flight of stairs, arrive at a landing, and then go through the front door. That's the typical way of, of entering a house in Chicago and many other cities too. This is not an unusual um, solution. But Richardson introduced to Chicago this idea of the entrance straight at the street. So that sense of separating yourself from the life of the city and the life of the dwelling occurs immediately. Now, many people like the idea of that transition, going up the stairs and rising and getting to the landing. That's a kind of indeterminate in-between zone that makes you still part of the community, but also still part of your own private sphere. Here, there's a desire to make that break between the public and the private clear and immediate. And if you come up onto that uh, porch up above, you can see the exploitation of these Tuscan columns. This is the door from the owner's bedroom, the owner and his wife's bedroom, out onto the porch. So it would have been a very lovely place uh, to take either the evening air or morning air. And the use of a whole series of details that in some cases at the top, you can see dentals derived from classical architecture. The columns are the tight little Tuscan columns. In other cases, the ornaments based on circles and squares and uh, polygons, uh, as you can see in the door. All of this kind of vocabulary is, is present here in this building. OK, so that's the Charnley House. I told you it would be short that I wanted to show you. And now let me show you. Has John's reputation preceded him here? Is this an architect that you already know? This is, it, John Ronan is about the same age as Jeannie Gang. Uh, he is, I think, in that generation, the other really distinguished young architect uh, in Chicago. He's done a number of buildings across the scale. He's done schools and residential developments at the, that are very challenging and difficult. He's had uh, a few high-end um, projects. The Poetry Foundation is an entity in Chicago that a few years ago was, was given a gift of $100 million. That would be $200 million, right? Something like that. $100 million as an endowment. And they began to say, well, we can do many things that we haven't been able to do before. One of which the decision was made to build a headquarters space that would celebrate great poetry uh, and to which people could uh, attend. It's in Chicago. Uh, the magazine Poetry, uh, which is the 
probably, I think it's fair to say, the most important, also one of the oldest, uh, magazines of poetry in the United States ha was founded and published in Chicago from early in the 20th century. It's still published. It's still part of, of this place. And the Poetry Foundation itself is a brick of a building. It's this guy right here. It's in a neighborhood of residential high rises that I make no claim to being distinctive. Well, they might be distinctive, but be not particularly good. The building is set on the northeast corner of its block. And there's a, it, it, they couldn't acquire the entire block, so there's this L-shaped character to it. It's entered from the corridor. You move behind that screen into a courtyard and then into the building here. There's an, a, a rich stairway here a public reading room here, a gathering room uh, back here. And Ronan began to look at the site, look at his ideas. There's sort of the block of the building and the slot of the, uh, of the garden, and begins to say, well, how do these elements uh, put together? And you, as you look at the image, it becomes a, a slab, an L-shape, a U-shape, two trapezoidal volumes, a larger and smaller rectangle, a rectangle that's hollowed out in the center, move the mass of the building to the corner and open up the courtyard in the interior, have the mass of the building along the street, have the courtyard be in the interior. In other words, he's trying to go through, well, let's just iterate all of the ways in which we can put together the components of the program uh, and then begin to, sit, to examine each of them and see which works, which is uh, successful and meaningful. He then begins to say, how do we actually construct this? And so we begin to look at facade and enclosure materials of many different sorts. Fairly early on, as you can see, the idea of cutting open the corner of the building that faces the street has been accepted. So that's one of the things that's involved here. The idea of, this, of the, there being a screen along the street seems to be accepted fairly early on and then manipulated in a variety of ways. Here, the screen seems much more opaque. But in most cases, the screen is quite transparent, in some cases semi-transparent. So all of those kinds of possibilities are being explore, explored. He's beginning to think about qualities of light and color in this drawing. This is the courtyard, as he's beginning to think about that, how this works, what its relationship is to other elements. But you can see from the character of the line that this is very much a preliminary exploration. He's thinking. Um, through what's happening. As it begins to develop further, the idea of the courtyard as a kind of elongated sea starts to emerge. The introduction of a performance space back here, or a space for readings, begins to emerge. The introduction of back of the house and service spaces in this zone emerges. The large poetry reading room uh, of double height uh, emerges here, and an important stair that's visible as soon as you come through the door begins to emerge here. And finally, a large open get transition and gallery space that provides connection between inside and outside. In the second level, and this is only a building of two levels, there are a series of offices and other elements. There is a uh, an open space up here so for an upper level for the reading room, which gets um, modified subsequently. There's open space uh, up above for certain purposes. There's double-heighted space, as you can see here. The staircase begins to be developed uh, a little bit more, as you can see here. In section, that then, that means that, and let's see, this is looking uh, from south to north. Uh, this is south, this is north along the narrow. So here's that staircase as he begins to imagine it, the entry vestibule, the character of the garden. And then he's beginning to think, well, how does he develop some of these spaces? What is the character of other spaces like? And then as he imagines it in longi uh, longitudinally, the street is here, the alley is back here. So this is west, uh, this is east. He then is beginning to under, look at the ways in which, if this is stacked like this, then do I make that stacked like that? 
so he's beginning to look at repetition in uh, various elements. He then, as the uh, design begins to be refined, he starts to then explore both the enclosure, the garden spaces, the gallery spaces, how they can uh, notch together. Can he really take, make it an advantage? If this owner didn't want to sell the building, then you've got, to, uh, you've got to simply accept that and then work with it. Then begins to, as, as the plan begins to develop further, there is the development of a large scale site model that allows him to care, explore the characteristic of the building over time. I should say too that the garden is on the north side of the site, which means that throughout, even with the tall buildings obviously will shade the site, uh, the garden is, uh, themselves, but it also means that throughout much of the year, all of the garden will be in shade. Uh, the sun is low enough in the sky that no direct sun uh, will enter the garden. But if, if, he, if he'd placed it on the south side of the building, that would have been the case uh, uh, it, as well. So he then, here you see the building as, as completed, this idea of the screen, which now is developed as a metal screen, then opening up to invite you inside by going up a couple of steps. There's also a ramp for the disabled and then inviting you along the space into the garden. There was a, a significant concern for the quality of the building illuminated at night, both the garden space as here and the building volumes themselves here. As you can see, most of the wall materials are made of glass that is, that is either transparent or translucent. As you step into the garden space, you're both, you then quite quickly become protected by the building, can move along, this, uh, along the space into the courtyard. So your path is very clear and the idea of some arrival zone in the distance is also clear. And it's also important that since this is the place of public presentations at the museum, or at the, the gallery, and since most programming is done in the evening, that means that this whole volume is illuminated at night as people approach the building, giving them a sense of welcome as, as they arrive here. They've embedded the word into the steps as you enter, and then as you come into the garden, you can see this uh, idea of s slots in the ground plane the, uh, the small, still, still relatively small planting, plantings, the exploitation of reflection in both directions uh, in the walls, the walls here of books, books of poetry, right? rather more books of poetry than uh, you might otherwise know. And then as you, start, as you come through the entrance, there is the hallway that then leads down to the performance space with an image of Harriet Monroe, the founder of the magazine Poetry. So she, her presence uh, uh, is here, uh, is throughout. As you turn the other way, you can see the stair going up to your left, and again, this wall uh, of books, and then a large table on which you can get whatever book you want and then sit and read it. Uh, one of the first, uh, this building was completed just about the same time that I visited you in October of 2011, and one of the words that I learned then that seems very important in Portuguese culture is the word, and excuse my bad pronunciation, saudade. Uh, it says a lot about the character of what it is to be Brazilian. Well, there are both Brazilian and Portuguese poets whose works are in this uh, library, fortunately for me, in English translation. And I found myself reading about poets exploring this concept of saudade. So I now have this tiny little insight into some of the things that, um, that are important in, in your culture. But that, I think, is one of the purposes of poetry, to open up a new world to you. What, whatever the question is in your head, you're, the chance is pretty good that someone will have thought about it as well. And if you're lucky, a very good poet will have uh, thought about it or shown you something you hadn't even thought about. And then from the uh, interior, from the, uh, from the performance space, you can see back across the court, courtyard too. And I think it's a very powerful thing. In a building devoted to poetry, poetry is mostly something that exists as a printed form. Now, many of you may read poetry on your uh, tablets. 
Uh, a tablet would be an ideal size for a sonnet, right? Um, so there are some things that tablets are ex ex exceptionally good for. So, but still, the idea of the respect that this implies for the, uh, the enormous work that poets do, I think, is important. There's also the fact that most architects, I expect you, too, have been exposed to that discussion by the French novelist Victor Hugo, Victor Hugo in Notre Dame de Paris. In the middle of the book, he says, he writes a chapter entitled, Ceci tuera cela, this will kill that. The book will kill the building. And it's his argument that until, the invention, until Gutenberg, poets wrote in stone. So for Hugo makes the argument, Notre Dame de Paris, that poetry is achieved in stone and that by inventing the printing press, Gutenberg has made it now possible for a poet to express himself in words on a page. And so, in Hugo's analysis, architecture declines. Frank Lloyd Wright read Victor Hugo, thought it was very important, and in his own early work, he set for himself the task of being the great poet of architecture. Uh, he, read, he thought that architecture was poetry, and he would be a great poet of architecture. And having those two prop elements then together in one place, I think, is a, is, is a real benefit. An ar architecture of very high quality reflecting the work of other artists of very high quality. And here's another view in that library space. And as you, I'm sure, inferred, the view from the reading room space then out across the open space uh, is very lovely. One thing, though, is the uh, the staff will not permit you to take a book out of the reading room into the terrace. And I think that uh, that's a policy that ne needs to be re-examined. Here, th here you can see the two, the, the, the two stairs. There's the monumental stair that leads up, up above, which now the users of the building, and this always happens, the users of the building have decided they don't want ordinary people coming seeing the staircase and climbing the stairs and going upstairs because there, there is, in fact, nothing public happening there. So they put a little sign here saying, don't come upstairs, don't bother us. And then the stair that you can use is the stair that leads you to the upper level of the book stack, and that's very much smaller. I, I have a feeling that had this realization occurred before, Ronan would have suppressed the importance of this stair probably moved it elsewhere. If, there, if you want vertical circulation just for the staff, then don't make it the most inciting thi exciting thing you see as you come through the door. And he would have then expanded the character of the subsidiary stair. But this is a, a demonstration, too, that, you, that once you hand the key to the owner, uh, you can't really control what it is that they're going to do. If you do get up that stair, the view across the space is lovely. So you can see that he's uh, actually achieve something very, very pleasant. Or f from up in the upper level of the reading room, the view back across the building uh, is, e is equivalently uh, attractive. And in the distance, you can see the other big buildings of Chicago. But by making a, a building of domestic scale and then allowing you to experience the building from within, mostly at domestic scale, it's an extraordinary gift uh, in the city where Everything that you've passed by before you arrive here is of a very big scale. And now you can come into a place where the scale is small and where the book of poetry, as you know, is usually very small. And here's an evening uh, view across the space that reinforces uh, what I've been saying uh, all along. And I want to finish up by showing you a series of drawings that were generated in the office. I mean, the first set of drawings and models, I think, that I showed you were very much done by hand, done with ordinary materials in a fairly quick way. But uh, like you, I expect most of you designed with the computer as well. And so here's the exploitation of computer graphics, which allows one to visualize many things very quickly. Uh, so there's a series of establishing uh, opacity, transparency, circulation, uh, plan planarity, you, as you go through here, you can see uh, 
the, uh, again, uh, other ideas of opacity and enclosure. Uh, so all of, these, all of these qualities that you can think about in using in a building are being explored very quickly. This is one of the things that gra uh, computer graphic rendering uh, allows you to do. Okay. From the loop or the lakefront or out in the water even. And I thought I should show it to you another way. And to do that, I wanted to show you a series of projects. Uh, I'm lucky enough to be a member of a jury for an, uh, some architectural prizes that are given to architects in Chicago who are doing work that benefits um, their local community. And these are usually communities of working and lower middle class people, people who don't ordinarily get the services of um, gifted architects. And it's, uh, it's been a pleasure to be involved with this. On the Chicago River, uh, which you see here on the upper left, it was decided that it was important to develop the riverfront as parkland, although it's not been done yet. And just south of where this park is, is another park that's adjacent to Chicago's Chinatown. It's been phenomenally successful, both for the immediate community and for the larger community. The, ar the landscape architect for that park and actually the landscape here is a member of our, of our jury. And we were here looking at this building, which is a boathouse, where you can rent a canoe or a kayak and then put it into the river and then go uh, paddling around. So it's a public park. It's open to the public. The rentals are uh, very affordable. And as you can see above, the view of the city in the distance is powerful and the survival of ancient elements of Chicago's architecture are also in play. And I've tried to put together a series of images in which sort of before the park, as you can see on the bottom left, and then what happens when this open space is designed in such a manner that it relates to what's beyond. How you can, as in Chinese uh, landscape theory, how you can borrow a landscape. And in this case, the landscape that is borrowed is the industrial an architectural, the industrial and architectural heritage of Chicago. The next building I want to show you is the Black Ensemble Theater in Chicago, a, a theater that was developed by uh, this woman uh, who has put together a troupe of actors who are the Black Ensemble, who are pretty amazing, uh, and then, ra then raised the money to build a performance space for the company uh, that is in a neighborhood of, of, of performance spaces uh, to attract them uh, to, use, uh, to use it. The next piece I want to show you is a residential development. This is typically the, ver the most difficult thing to wring some real architecture out of because the demands of residential development are very, very hard. And these, the amount of space you have, the quality of the materials you can use, all of this are, are very, very difficult. This is a project in uh, the south side neighborhood of Chicago known as Woodlawn. Uh, there was, in the 1960s and 70s, an important local neighborhood organization, an African American organization, called the Woodlawn Organization that put itself together and began to have some significant success. That organization, though, came apart, as, as, as happens sometimes, and many of its works uh, have, have disappeared. There's now been a reinvestment uh, in the site by the uh, city's housing agency, and this is one of the, uh, the, the, the beginning of, of the projects uh, here on this site. There is, a, as you can see, a direct relationship to the street, a desire to, for the plant, these are early stages of the plantings, but a desire for the plantings to contribute to the environment. Here you see on the left the entrance into the building, and then at the back, this is a very new building and so it's fairly raw, the development of a series of patio or courtyard spaces for the occupants of the building. And with these long channels of plant, it keeps these elements away from the intrusion of the automobile, which you see here. So there are a series of seating areas that are raised and this garden space running along here that you saw from the other point of view. So there's a very, one of the best things about this small thing is the exploitation of, the, uh, of, of, of plantings to en enhance the uh, entire experience. 
the apartments themselves are exactly the kinds of apartments um, you would expect. They are not particularly large. They do are they are absent almost all architectural grace. They are, but they are safe. They are comfortable. They are affordable, uh, and that uh, and that is uh, that is important. To the north of the site are these buildings by Stanley Tigerman, an architect who is now um, in his mid 80s and, and not very well. He designed these apartment buildings, which are these buildings, as, as you look at them and think about their use, are not very bit different from these buildings. In other words, uh, social housing uh, has its demands, which uh, survive uh, very powerfully. These buildings are, th this block of buildings will be kept, but because the management failed uh, for the other buildings in the, in the complex, they've been torn down. They had been effectively de been destroyed by lack of maintenance and by uh, uh, proper tenant management or tenant, tenant organization. And so that's, uh, that also is a factor that has to be understood and, and, and faced. There's another kind of building that in Chicago for um, people whose lives would be best characterized as mar marginal, people who've been in jail, people who have been addicted to drugs of one sort or another. And they're generally housed in buildings that, are, that we call SRO, single room occupancy. So it's a single person living in a single room. The buildings often have public dining rooms. So the person is not either likely to create a fire uh, by in the, in the space, but also not likely to be responsible for their cooking. Uh, this is, an, as you could guess, this is an existing uh, apartment hotel that is then repurposed. The details around the front door, around the fireplaces, these are the various terracotta tiles that were used throughout the building. And so the architects, when they found this, started to say, okay, let's g gather up all the ones that we can find and then ca calculate how many new ones we need to uh, fire so we can then have, uh, then use these as things that add some real character uh, to the building. In addition to solving the problem of the building, which you see in its long way here, and you can guess that the apartment here that faces this courtyard is not very big, right? And its, it's uh, interior character is not very high. But the site also included this open space, which is planted to a garden. The site also includes a small restaurant and a training kitchen for people who are just out of jail, are, have abuse problems. And so they're taught about cooking, they're taught culinary arts. They have their own garden, and that food goes into both their own food and the ser food they serve the public uh, at the front of the space. They've gotten to the point that their chickens are producing eggs that they're able to preserve. Now, this is in the middle of a big city, and it's a, an, an, in, an indication of a phenomenon in American cities of using open spaces as gardens, as, as both public gardens that are then become commercial market gardens. The, the product of the gardens is either used by the institution itself or actually sold into the larger community. And this is, there have been a number of examples of this that have been uh, very successful. Another kind of uh, project of th that occurs is taking a no longer attractive office building and convert it to residential use. This is a building that was the headquarters of the office building for a company that made women's hairpins, those long hair hairpin objects, the hump hairpin company. This was their office building. It's made of stone and terracotta. It occupies a site at the intersection of uh, two angled streets, so the form is of a flat iron. On the second floor of the building is a large performance space uh, behind these, these large windows that then looks out over the neighborhood. And here's the front door to the building and the view out of those uh, windows I just showed you into the kind of neighborhood lots of brick and terracotta, uh, this commercial intersection. And if you go up to the roof, you have two kinds of scales around you. Uh, in one direction, you have the scale of these two and a half story houses that I said were the 
general character of Chicago, a canopy of trees that floats above the roofs of the houses. And the neighborhoods are marked by the towers and volumes of the different parish churches. Uh, it could be a Catholic church, it could be a Presbyterian church, it could be a Baptist church, right? They're, uh, Americans have a wide diversity of, of, of religious practice. So that's one kind of skyline in an otherwise flat landscape. But from the roof of the building, you can see that intersection we just looked at ago. And then a long way away is that mountain range of Chicago's tall buildings. And I show you this, and I'll have a couple of more images to show you as well. That, in, that place far away is a kind of emerald city. Many people who live here never go here. Right? The daily life of a small community, even in a big city, is concentrated around the intersection, around the bodega, around the church, around the school. And most of the people in the neighborhood have no reason to go far away, go to that distant place. And so that even if you manipulate the camera and do a, a long lens uh, shot, the mountain range of the city is quite different than the plain, the mountain range of the center city is quite different from the plain of the rest of the city. One of the most interesting things that's occurred in the last several years is the construction of a series of schools that are sort of public and sort of private. Uh, in, in the United States, there is, for a whole variety of reasons that, aren't worth go, that would take too much time to go into, a real questioning of the idea of the benefit of free public education for all children. Of course, the fundamental reason for that is only an educated citizenry can conduct their own business in governing themselves. Uh, this is the fundamental concept of, of, of modern republican democracies. Um, but there's a real questioning about that. Some people say, gee, I don't like my local public school. I want to found my own private school. And one of the systems that have been developed in the United States is something called charter schools. They get money from the public, but then they operate privately. The schools tend to be placed on the periphery of neighborhoods rather than in the center of neighborhoods. Remember that image I showed you earlier of the typical Chicago residential neighborhood and at the very center was the school. These uh, buildings, while they're adjacent to residence, residential neighborhoods, tend to be on, on the periphery. So this is the UNO, is uh, the United Neighborhood Organization, is the name of the organization. There's this large space here. The school cafeteria is down here. The library is up here. And the classrooms are in the long slab of the building that runs in this direction. And if you go up into the library, you get, in the interior, a fairly dramatic space. Uh, Patricia Natke is the name of the architect who did this. She's a very gifted architect. Uh, I like much of her work. Uh, but the view from the school is of a railroad yard and a complex of factories. Uh, Mars candy bars are made in Chicago, and that, that's who that's all about. There's another kind of um, school, and this is actually a public high school, not a charter school. Uh, it, is, it, takes, it took several existing buildings and tied them together. The architect, Juan Moreno, is here. The principal of the school, and I'm not going to remember his name right now, is here. And although Juan is a good architect, and I hope to show you that he did an interesting job of knitting this building together into a school, this gentleman, the principal of the school, is the person who makes it work. There, there, is, there is the case that institutions, to be genuinely successful, need some kind of charismatic central figure. And this gentleman believes that the children in this school should, this is a school for children who are intended to enter the health sciences, so they will become a practical nurse. They will become a registered nurse. They will become a physician. They will become a, an oncological surgeon. They will become a research cardiologist, right? The, the opportunity in the medical professions is infinite. Uh, and this gentleman understands that. And he understands that the children of his neighborhood, the immediate neighborhood is largely Hispanic in origin. Uh, the student body is largely Hispanic and African American. And it's his view that no one should be able to, should be unable to take advantage of the best possible education 
or have the most um, uh, advanced dreams. And so this becomes a key part of what's going on. So if you go up into the building, you can see across the flatness of the city, the, what the, one of the very large, I think it's, actually it's the largest hospital complex in Chicago. There are at least four separate very large hospitals and medical schools in this complex. Uh, and then just to the right, you can see that series of towers of the city, but also the tower of the local parish church just here. So that relationship between the towers of the neighborhood and the towers of the distant city uh, remains uh, in play. The students in the classrooms routinely, or this is a, a, a case with, with many new schools in Chicago, the students in Sao Paulo wear uniforms? They do, okay. In, in the United States, when I grew up, nobody wore a uniform. Uh, that, that was well known. Children who went to um, parochial church schools might wear a uniform. The children who went to the public schools would wear something that was clean and neat, but they would never wear a uniform. Now the idea of a uniform is extraordinarily attractive because the parent knows as long as I, that two sets of khakis, two white shirts, and two navy sweaters, one can be in the laundry and one can be on the kid. That's, that makes shopping very much easier than having the kid want to wear something different every, every day. So uh, the children in the school are exciting. The metal you see in the glass is, one of, is something the architect didn't want to have. He wanted to make the building as transparent as possible so that children in the hallway would have visual access of the classroom and the other way around. They had to put metal in the glass because of the city's fire codes uh, and they couldn't get this, uh, couldn't work around it. And uh, when, we, when, we were, when we were visiting, this young man who was about to graduate from this high school um, was in the midst of selecting, was, was he going to a series of elite American universities in a pre-medical program. And he was an example of what can happen if a school works well and addresses the needs of the children. Now, we asked this young man how long it was, we asked several of the students how long their trip was to school. And a couple of kids lived in the neighborhood and it was less than five minutes. A couple of kids, their parents drove them. This young man took, had a commute each way, each day, of three hours on a bus, a train, and a bus to get to school, but he wanted to be here. The school was welcoming to him, and he's been extraordinarily successful. And, of course, it's, it's that possibility of self-transformation that has always been the promise of cities. The Germans say, uh, the, there's the German phrase that you may know, Stadt Luft macht frei. If you are in a city, you are a free person. In Germany, this, in the Middle Ages, in Germany, this was literally the case. If you got away from the feudal knight who controlled your life and got into a city, you then could act and be a free man. Uh, and that idea that cities are transforming places has uh, remained extraordinarily powerful in the Western tradition. And there's uh, a concern now in place, in our, in certainly in my city, that, that continue to be the case. This is not a place where people come to fail. It's a place that people come to succeed. I'm talking about you, right? I mean, you're all going to school at night. You've got good jobs. You know that you can, you can imagine something better for yourself, and you're working very hard to achieve it. Well, that's, what, that's always what cities have been about. Another one of the UNO schools by the same Juan Moreno that you saw in the last, uh, for the last building uh, is this one. Very, very flashy, very, very expensive. Uh, the reflectivity of elements in all of the flashy, shiny metal um, is, is very, very strong. But what really bothered me is, as again, as at that other UNO school, it's adjacent to an industrial site and, is not, and it's on a busy commercial street. It's a long way from its neighborhood. And this is something that uh, is often the case with these charter schools and is something that I, I think is unfortunate. Now, the reason they're here in part is because industrial sites are becoming available for other uses. The city is deindustrializing, so that has to be acknowledged. But there's also the case that they are not, they are on, at best on the periphery of residential environments rather than at their center. And from this school, you can see planes coming into line, land at the airport 
and the tall buildings in the far distance. The last building I want to show you is another example of the kind of transitions that children in Chicago are facing. This is a building done by Patricia Natke, the same architect who did that slope-roofed uh, building I showed you a few minutes ago. The building is in the neighborhood of Chicago called Pilsen, which was named that because it was settled by people from Bohemia, um, where Pilsner beer and Pilsen and, and all of those towns are located. The community is now, and so it was a point of immigration for people from Central Europe. Uh, more recently, it's been a point of immigration for people from Mexico and other parts of Latin America. And so, and the perception in Chicago is children from that background find it difficult to break away from the family. And so what has been done is to, this is a college dormitory in the middle of a residential neighborhood where the children grew up. And the, uh, and the, the, chil the students, the young students, these are people from 18 to 22, are, are students of universities in the uh, center city or elsewhere in the city. But there was a perception that some students, while they wanted to live away from home, they didn't want to live too far away from home. And in some cases, as you can see, the, the, the moms come in on the weekend and fix food for the children and then put it in the fridge and you know write Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday on it so that there is this connection to home and also this experience of being independent. Because as some of you may know, I, this may have been the case for you, the first time you slept away from home was you were 18 or 20 or something. Uh, this is often the case here. With the kind of middle class background I had, I, the first time I slept away from home, I think I was four or five. I was going away to summer camp for one or two weeks uh, routinely by the time I was seven or eight. I mean, this is one kind of experience that children have. But in Chicago, there are many children who have never been away from home. And so that experience of being separated from your family is a powerful one. And the idea here with this building is to address that. So one of the things that it does, that it, it provides windows from the dormitory that look back to the neighborhood where the, uh, the students who were living here came from. And it also looks across the city at again, at more of that uh, neighborhood that was part of their, their growing up experience. And then it can look in another direction to the local church, something that keeps them tied to where they are. And in the distance, the city where they go to school, most of the universities that they attend are here in the loop, or, and also where they begin to find jobs. So there's a real effort here to provide a place where this kind of transition from one sort of life to another uh, can occur. And as, we, as you think about the resi uh, two of the residential types I've shown you now are for people who will live there only for a short time. If that residential hotel I showed you, both of them are successful, the occupants will become successful. They will move on to their own jobs, find their own apartments or houses, and have a successful life. Here the idea is that the students will soon be able to leave this place, maybe move into the house next door to their parents, or maybe take a job in California or uh, Paris, right? The, uh, the, the possibilities for them are infinite. But it's also deeply concerned about tying to the school. The little sign that you see here, that's the sign in front of the local grade school. And so what you see is children leaving the grade school over here, going to the Palateria guy. I don't, I don't know what you, uh, in Chicago, the, um, the uh, the Spanish language term for a, a cart that has uh, paletas, ice, I, uh, popsicles. I don't know what, um, what you call them. Picolets. Picolets? OK, that's what we're talking about. The guy is here, on, and this is a warm day. The guy is here on the corner, so you can see the kids buying them. And then they come here to a, um, a, a, a church-based uh, afternoon center, where the, because both parents are likely working, the children leave leave school at about 3, and then are here from 3 until 6 or 7, whenever their parents are through from, with work, and then they can go home. And so the residential building, this is what the, one of the common rooms of, of the dormitory that I've just been showing you, 
has these young people who are, are going to college now still connected to the kids who are going to school uh, 10 or 15 years younger than, or 10 years younger than they are. Thank you.